it. But let's open to the book of Revelation. Now, this morning is going to be a fascinating time, at least for me, because this is about theology. And I, I was saying in first service, when I get to one of the parts of the message, it reminds me so much of 30 years ago when I used to stand and lecture in uh, systematic theology at the Master's Seminary. And just the delight of, of teaching truth about God and connecting it. But this morning, we're looking at the wrath of God. And uh, we're contrasting it to the, the depravity of humanity. And depravity means that we are born sinners. We sin because we're sinners. It's not because we caught it from the environment or something. And that God has declared all of us to be lost and hopeless and bound in our sins. And sin, even one, invites the wrath of God. And that... that truth of the character of God, because God's moral attributes, one of them is, the eighth one, is his wrath is forever against sin. So wherever there's sin, God's wrath is pointed at that sin. And so in a real sense, this morning, Revelation illustrates that truth more than any other passage. So this morning, as we continue through Revelation, we have come to one of the key doctrines of the Bible. And, and, and Paul said the time would come when people wouldn't want to hear the key doctrines of the Bible and they would turn away their ears from hearing it. And this is one that uh, most people aren't real interested in, but it's the doctrine of the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is a part of the absolute justice of God. And what the absolute justice of God is, is that no sin escapes his notice. No sin does he overlook, does he forget, does he miss one. God is absolutely just and he is ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe. And he sees and remembers and records every sin. His absolute justice demands that. Well, no sin can go unpunished with God's absolute holiness and justice. He just can't let one say, oh, that's all right. That one's on the house, you know. You, you can try again. He can't say that. So even though there may be little or no evident response from God, for most of the sins poured out by most of the people throughout all of history, God does not, and I was thinking that this week, I was um, watching uh, a little piece on the trial of this, this kidnap rapist uh, guy in Cleveland that in car or chained up or whatever he did, those, those three women, and, and they finally got him sentenced, and, and he got a 1,000 years. And, and I thought it would have been fitting because uh, in God's sight, the sin was so great that he already declared in the Old Testament the man should have been executed. In the Old Testament, he, if they would have followed the law, he would have been. It would have been something at the trial if after the sentence was given, if all of a sudden fire came down, right? Wouldn't that have just shocked everybody? But God doesn't do that. God is not a God that just zaps people. There's almost no apparent result for the Idi Amins, you know, the dictator of Uganda that, that horribly tortured and butchered his own people for so many decades. I mean, there's just no visible, evident response. But God's justice has kept track of every sin, every sin by anyone against the infinite, all-knowing God. He keeps track of it. That is God. But there's a moment coming when the river of humanity sins, piling up behind the dam of God's patience, reaches the limit. See, what is going to happen is that God has already declared that there's going to come a point in human history when the, the huge lake of sins that humanity has piled up is going to burst and his wrath pours out. And that is what the Bible describes as the tribulation period, when God just pours out his wrath upon humanity and wrath is one of God's moral attributes. It's described in the Bible. In fact, here's going back 30 years. Let's, uh, here's a page out of what we study as elders and deacons on, uh, once a month at our meeting. We, we study theology, and theology is the codification and the systemization of the truths about God that are recorded in the Bible. And so in systematic theology, you have the attributes of God, and there are 20, and there are incommunicable and communicable. Incommunicable, we are not infinite, we are not eternal, we are not omniscient, you know, it's the, those aspects. But communicable, we share 
in an understanding as humans of these. And the communicable attributes in his moral uh, being is that God is good. And we recognize goodness. And sometimes we, we do things that are good. And we know goodness, but God is perfectly good. And God is perfectly love. That's one of his attributes. God is love, First John tells us. And another one is God is mercy. And mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And grace is giving us what we don't deserve. And patience is he doesn't do it right now. It's amazing how God is so restrained in, in his mercy. And then holiness. I mean, that is a, a very big part of God's who he is, his character. He is absolutely separate from sin. Uh, dwelling in unapproachable light to whom no one can approach him because he is so perfect and holy and separate, as the scriptures say, from sinners. And then there's peace. I was having a little discussion about this with one of my children. I said, did you know one of the characters of God is peace? And peace for us is just quietness, but that's not what it is. Biblically, peace in the Old Testament, shalom, the, the noun, uh, means peace. You know, when people say shalom, hello. But the verb form, shalom, means to be made complete. It's orderliness. It's everything being where it's supposed to be and, and not disintegrating, falling apart, disorderly, dissonant. It's complete, and it's there. And that's God. He is peace. And a byproduct of peace is God is not a God of disorder. You know, we're surrounded, and life is, and for many people, or they're very disorderly, but, but we're surrounded by disorder, and God is a God of peace, of order. Another attribute is his righteousness, which has to do with his justice. And God is so righteous, so perfectly just, he cannot overlook sin. That's part of his nature. And so that means he's jealous. That's another element of his moral character. And by the way, when we get to the seventh and eighth, these ones we hardly talk about. Usually to us, jealousy is bad. You know, we talk about, oh, they're just jealous, you know, in a negative sense. But God is perfectly jealous. God wants all of our attention, all of our affection, all of our love. He wants all of our loyalty. He wants us to be faithful to him. But that last moral attribute is the one we're looking at this morning and the most beautiful illustration of it is right here in the book of Revelation. God's wrath is his intense hatred and inability to allow to continue without dealing with sin. He is wrathful against sin. You know, you, you know the verse, you can be sure your sin will find you out. God says you can be sure that I'm going to find every sin. And, you know, the sweet elderly lady this morning that said to me when I said, oh, I'm dying because I'm a sinner, she says, no, no, you're not a sinner. I says, oh, yes, I am. I said, a very great sinner. But I said, you only need to sin once to incur the wrath forever of God. And that's part of his character. Well, now we get to the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation talks about the fact that God's wrath is a big, big part of theology. And let me just read to you what uh, one of my friends, I, have, I call authors my friends. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce died in the year 2000, but I have every book that he's ever written. This is what he wrote about the wrath of God. In the Old Testament, there are more than 20 words used to refer to God's wrath. There are other very different words that relate to human anger. And those 20 words are used in nearly 600 important passages in the Bible, on the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is a huge doctrine in the Bible. And, and it, it's 20 different Hebrew words to describe how God looks in wrath at sin. That's a big, big. And what's amazing is these are not obscure topics. They're basic. They're integrated into the major events of the Scripture. And the first time God's wrath shows up in Revelation is right here in Revelation 6. So if you open to Revelation chapter 6, we're going to read in just a moment, verses 12 onward. But as we read, we're going to notice something. And what I want to do is I want to alert you to what we're going to see. First, we see, when we see the word wrath in the English Bible, it's translating one of two different Greek words. There are two different words God has chosen in his engineering plan for communicating his word to us. He has chosen two different words because it takes two different Greek terms to describe God's wrath. The first Greek word is God having a fierce rage. This is the Greek word that I will point out to you throughout the text, thumas. 
Thumas, described in Greek dictionaries, is to rush along fiercely. Now, all of us have seen this. You've seen someone. They are fiercely in great, volatile, explosive wrath. And they are in the heat of violence. And they even breathe violently. You ever met someone that's just, I mean, they're panting with anger. Now, what's amazing is, is to imagine this word thinking of someone panting with incredible rage only in Revelation. It's not some sinful human. It's the very God of the universe. And in Revelation, the infinite holy God steps onto the stage of human events, panting with fierce, visible rage. Now, that's, that's not one of the more popular. You don't see, you know, go down to Hallmark and they won't have God, you know, panting with rage. No one would buy that card. We don't like that. Unless it was about someone else. But that's about our sin. That's how he feels. Now, the second word, uh, and this is the even deeper, stronger word. And the second word is we see God as having a smoldering wrath. This is the word horge in Greek. Now, it's used outside of referring to wrath as something growing ripe. It's like watching that prized tomato as it first is a blossom, then it's a little tiny round little green dot, and then it gets bigger and it starts to turn color, and then it, it fills out and gets deep red, and it ripens. It gets full and ready. It's that long-term aspect that we see here. And this is how Revelation portrays God. God who stores up his holy, his just, and his perfect wrath against sin finally unleashes it. What we're going to see in, in verses 12 to 17 is the God of the universe not just suddenly flaring up, but holding a long-standing and ever-increasing hatred for sin that's a part of his very nature. So that's what attribute is. It's part of God's nature that God is forever wrathful against sin. And we see in Revelation what he's going to do about sin. So Almighty God in Revelation is viewed as stepping into earth's events, panting with rage, that's Thumas, and also having this deeply settled and long built up wrath against sin and sinners who refuse to repent. You want to know how to draw the wrath of God? Refuse to repent. Refuse. Put it off. Neglect. Ignore. Deny. Refuse. And it, it draws, invites the wrath of God. So in the New Testament, the wrath of God is most displayed here in the book of Revelation. So to set the stage for this doctrine, these two elements have to be in our mind as we're reading through these verses. So chapter 6, and what I thought is, it would be fun to read them together so we get the feeling of the panting, smoldering wrath of God and the events. So let's all stand together for the reading of God's word, and we'll read through these, and then I'll have a, a word of prayer before we go on. But Revelation 6, verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? And you know, the answer to the 17th verse is no one. No one can stand 
because we're all guilty sinners in need of the wrath of God. But we'll see the good news is coming. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you'd open our hearts to the truth that you, Lord Jesus, stood in our place, that you bore in your own body our sins and took them to the cross. And there, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on you, O Christ, was laid. And that's why we can now stand by your grace through faith in your sacrifice. And I would pray that someone here this morning who hears the truth of the Word of God, that believes and knows and understands and is convicted by your Spirit that they are sinners. Even if it's just one, it doesn't matter. The wages of sin, even one, is death. Eternal, conscious, torment, punishment from the face of you, O righteous and just God, unless we repent. I pray that you would draw some, even this morning, from the book of Revelation, from the proclamation of your word and by your spirit, to salvation, to repentance, so that your wrath will be forever satisfied against their sin. Teach us this morning, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Basically, you can take all this panting, smoldering wrath and, and see it in the Bible in three dimensions. The first dimension is this, and, and we'll get to this in the days ahead as we go through Revelation, but we can see God's eternal or ultimate wrath. That's eternal conscious punishment of sinners in hell. Now in Revelation 14, you see it first mentioned, the, the wrath of God that, that causes the, the sinners to go to the lake of fire. And then chapter 20 is the lake of fire in verse 15. But not only is there God's eternal or ultimate wrath, the Bible is filled with another type of wrath. And that is this period of time. It's called the day of the Lord. And it's the day of, of God's coming future wrath when the dam bursts. Now, hell is not the dam bursting. It is the, the localizing of all the people who have ever refused to repent into one place where God directs his wrath forever. And just puts that attribute of his, he just puts it right there, forever burning against their sin. But the day of the Lord is different. The day of the Lord is not hell. It's what we call the tribulation. It's God smiting the earth in the tribulation. And that's what so much of the Old Testament is about. So much of the Old Testament, in fact, if you read the book of Zephaniah, little three-chapter book, in the first chapter it talks about, it's talking about the Babylonians and how they destroyed Jerusalem. And then Zephaniah says, but that's nothing compared to the great and gloomy and horrific day of the Lord. See, all the prophets were looking at this future time. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, I hope, we'll be able to look at the constant warning of God's present wrath. You see, there are, for every sin that's ever committed by anyone, anywhere, saved or unsaved, there are consequences. Most of us are so unaware of that. I mean, we just, you know, yeah, a little lie here, a little lie there. Every time we sin, there is a consequence. There is a retributive consequence, which is a theological term for God has to make a retribution and, and judge that sin. But there's also in us a consequence. Every time you lie, you're a little less truthful. Every time you steal, you're a little less trustworthy. Every time that we get enraged, we're a little less under control. And every, there is a consequence. I mean, every time uh, someone abuses alcohol and becomes drunken, it's a destructive poison in their body. Same with other chemicals. Same with everything. Every, even immorality. The Bible says every time we commit immorality, there is a consequence in our body. So there is, there is God's present wrath, which shows up in the consequences of sin. And uh, we will, Lord willing, cover that. But let's just walk through and look at the, the usage of the words for wrath, starting in Revelation 6 and verse uh, 16. And what we see is in, in the chronicling of God's wrath, we see him going between the thumas panting wrath to the horge smoldering deep held in wrath. And in verse 16, that's the orge. It says, uh, uh, he who sits on the throne from the wrath, that's the settled uh, long building wrath of the Lamb. Then verse 17, it's the same word, the great day of his orge, his wrath has come. Now turn over to chapter 11 with me because I want you to see 
as this unfolds. The nations were angry, and your wrath, Jorge, has come. This built-up wrath. But, but look at what he says next in verse 18 of chapter 11. And the time of the dead, that is, they should be judged. So this is the retributive wrath. God has built up this long, smoldering wrath, and, and he's going to bring retribution. But look what else it says. There's a positive note in chapter 11, verse 18. And you should reward your servants. Uh, this is in theology. Theology likes to put big words with everything, but this is called the remunerative. You've heard of remuneration, getting paid. Remunerative means that God rewards. Look what it says in verse 18. You reward your servants, the prophets. Now, in God's justice, his retributive and remunerative justice, there is an exact accounting God knows exactly who is the biggest sinner and who sinned the most. God also knows who's the greatest servant who has served him the most. And he remunerates and has retribution that is coincidental and, and coincides with the amount. So that means, Jesus said, that that person who has sinned little will have few stripes. They will be punished less than one who has many sins. They'll have many stripes. So it does make a difference how bad you are in sin on earth and how much you serve the Lord for eternal rewards. And we'll, we'll cover that when we get deeper into Revelation 2. But look at verse 19. Here's the, the first, um, I'm sorry, chapter 14 in verse 10. Uh, this is the first time both words are in one verse. And it says, he himself shall also drink uh, the wine of the wrath. Now, this is not the smoldering, settled, long-standing. This is the thumos, the panting wrath of God. It's poured out like a cup of wine, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his, and here's the word wrath, horge, translated indignation. It's because two words that meant so similar, they, they translated them, rendered them a little differently. But it's both words. Thumas is the first one, the wrath of God, which speaks of the, the, the explosive panting wrath. And the indignation is the horge, the settled wrath. Now look at verse 19. It's Thumas again, into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Keep going to chapter 15, verse 1. Thumas again, the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath, Thumas, the panting of God is complete. Chapter 15, verse 7, I guess Thumas again, translated wrath, bowls full of the wrath or Thumas of God. Chapter 16, another occurrence of that, that panting, you know, visible wrath. Uh, it says in 16, 1, the bowls of the wrath of God. And then in verse 19, they're both there. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness, there's the panting, thumas, the, the thumas of his wrath, and that's the word horge. It's the settled, long, smoldering wrath. And then the last occurrence is in chapter 19. It's at the second coming. Now, this is what's so interesting to me in the doctrine of God. Here, here, people all the time say, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's killing all those Canaanites and all that bad stuff, and he's judging people, but Jesus, Jesus would never do that. And that's, that's kind of the, the liberal, social gospel, Albert Schweitzer-esque kind of, Jesus is so sweet, he wouldn't condemn anyone. But look, here's Jesus, chapter 19. He's actually riding a white horse at the front of all the hosts of heaven. The saints are there and all the, all the angels of heaven, the, the redeemed and righteous, or I mean the uh, uh, glorified angels that will never sin are behind him. But look at 19. Out of his mouth, Christ's mouth, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. The first time the earth sees Jesus after the resurrection. We've seen him. Uh, the disciples saw him. We see him in the church walking around in Revelation 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. He's being worshipped. First time the earth sees him, humans, since his resurrection. And, and he's got this sword and he's striking them. And then look what it says next. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. By the way, this is a little preview of the millennium. This is the fulfillment of all those verses in the Old Testament that Jesus is going to literally sit on the throne of his father David and rule over the nations. And Psalm 2 says, with a rod of iron. A lot of the Old Testament is about that. This shows us he's coming down with this sword, putting down the rebellion so that he can sit on earth and rule. But look what it says next. This is gentle, calm Jesus. He himself, that's Christ, 
treads the winepress of the thumas, that's the panting wrath, and the horge, that's the smoldering wrath of Almighty God. Jesus embodies the Almighty God's panting, smoldering wrath. Well, God's eternal wrath is a constant theme in Christ's ministry. Uh, if, if you know, Jesus was introduced by John the Baptist, his cousin. And John the Baptist said this. This is what John the Baptist said. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John the Baptist, introducing Jesus Christ, warned of this coming, smoldering, breaking out dam of God's mercy that has held it back, but letting out this wrath of God that culminates in hell. Now, after Jesus goes through the, the incredible evening visit of Nicodemus, and after he goes and shares with him about how you can be born again and how all sins can be forgiven, and God didn't send his, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might believe. Look how Jesus chooses to conclude that beautiful portrait. And he says this in verse 36. This is the, the record that Jesus chose to be the bookend to that great gospel presentation. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But look what happens. The wrath of God abides on him. And that is the eternal ultimate wrath. So that means anybody that's ever been born on this planet that does not repent and embrace Jesus Christ, the scriptures say the wrath of God will abide on them. Now this became, in Christ's ministry as he taught, a constant theme. Remember Jesus talked more about this wrath than he did about the, the pleasures and the joys of heaven. And in Matthew 8, 12, Jesus is teaching along. He said, beware of the wrath that will cast anybody who rebels into outer darkness. That is not a positive thing to be into outer darkness. In fact, you say, how can you talk about a furnace and fire and outer darkness? Because Jude tells us that the eternal fire of hell is in the blackness of darkness forever. It's the absence of light. Kind of like, you know how astronomers and astrophysicists have found the black holes that absorb their, their power, gravitational power is so great they can absorb even light and it just sucks it in and it's blackness. That's an that's a astrophysical description of the blackness of darkness that Jesus talks about. In Matthew 13, 42, Jesus is in a string of parabolic teaching and he said, beware of fake followers of Christ. He says they're like, they're, they look like real wheat, but they're tares. They're, they're fake. They have no fruit. They have not been born again. And they will be cast into the burning furnace of God's wrath. Jesus is always alluding to this horrible end. He says the same wrath is on the wicked in verse 50. Here's one where he puts them together. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, take extreme measures about sin. Don't think of sin as, oh, that's nothing I can worry about later. It's not, you know, someday I'll think about that or I'll get right or I'll do enough good. He says, take an extreme measure now. And this is what he said, if your hand or foot causes you to sin. Now, how many sins can you think of with your foot? Come on. What he's saying is, if any part of where you go, what you do, hands, feet, anything in your life is leading you to perpetuate sin and sinful behavior against a holy God, cut it off and cast it from you. What it means is get rid of that part of your life. Now, of course, the masochistic, mutilating type of people think that he's advocating hand cutting, you know, like Islam does. No. What he's saying is take radical means sin is that bad to God. And, and then he says this, it's better for you to enter into life maimed. You're dying. When you die is when we enter into life. That means what we're experiencing right now is pale compared to what he offers. That Jesus is implying we're not even in real life right now. We're just existing. Life is coming. But look at this. It's better to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands or feet and to be cast into the everlasting fire. Look at verse 9. To be cast into hell fire. Jesus, two for one. This is very exemplary of what he taught like. Life, that's heaven. 
Hell, hell. That's the wrath. Two for one. It's a very, very natural form or common formula with Jesus. Twice as much about judgment as about life. Well, real quickly, it's not just Christ, but this picks up in Paul's ministry. One of the most frequent usages outside of Revelation is Paul, in his epistle, he, he explains the wrath of God. And, and we don't have time to go through all these, but just the references on the screen. Romans 1.18, Lord willing, will be there next week. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. There is an element of the present horrific results of sin in a culture. Did you know America right now is the most blatant, in your face, before all the world to see, propagator of godlessness? I mean, in, in every way. I mean, uh, we recently had an election, uh, you know, what, in 12, so last year. And one of the parties that was nationally being elected in their platform had made planks that are abominations against God homosexuality, abortion. We actually have people running on platforms of sin, running our country, a Christian nation. Amazing. God is against that. He has strong warnings. He says, my wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness and those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And you know, a little uh, New York Times went out and they were interviewing some of the upscale college kids, you know, you know how New York is ringed by some of the greatest schools in the nation. They were out interviewing him, said, what do you think of abortion? One of them said, abortion? We should abort some of the kids that are alive. They aren't needed either. They're useless. I mean, college kids. They say, why just get them before they're born? Let's get them after. See, that's, that's the decline, the declension, the sinful spiral that sin undealt with goes into and only gets worse. And this is what the Lord says in Romans 2, 5. In accordance with your hardness, your impenitent heart, you, you resist God and you won't repent. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath. God doesn't respond. He doesn't burn up the, the uh, raping kidnappers on the spot. The guy that shot up the apartments in Miami or wherever it was last night and the... SWAT team took him out. God didn't burn him on the spot. He treasures up his wrath and waits. He's merciful. He's waiting for them to come to repentance. But if they don't, he's storing it up for the righteous judgment of God. Uh, in uh, Romans 2.8, both words show up. Those who are self-seeking don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness will face the indignation, that's the thumos, that's the panting wrath, and the horge, that's the settled wrath of God. Uh, when Paul shared the gospel in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, just to skip ahead, he told people, if you get saved, you're saved from the wrath to come. The eternal, ultimate wrath. So God is by nature characterized by a perfect, holy, and just hatred against sin that leads him to store up his fury. God stores up his fury, and in his wrath is settled and focused against sin. Do you see why Jonathan Edwards 300 and some years ago, or yeah, 300, almost 300 years ago, preached sinners in the hands of what? Yeah, this panting, smoldering, wrath of God. No sin can go unpunished because God is absolutely holy and just. So even though there may be little or no evident response from God, for most of the sins being poured out by fallen and sinful humans, God's justice has kept track of every sin ever sinned against the infinite, all-knowing, holy God of the universe. He's got a record of every one of them. But a moment is coming when the river of humanity's sins piling up behind the dam of God's patience finally reaches the limit. And when that limit is reached and the dam is breached, the righteous, infinite, just wrath of Almighty God bursts forth. And that's Revelation 6, 17. That's the event when it happens. When the wrath of God for whom no one can stand, breaks out. You know, we would have to live in constant fear of messing up and facing that furious wrath if someone had not told us the glorious truth of the cross. See, the, the truth of the cross is we can't stand before the wrath of God. 
But Jesus stood before it and took it in our place. See, that's what the cross is. Jesus became the target of the wrath of God that was poured out on him. And what he said is, anybody that will agree with me that they're a helpless, lost, hopeless sinner and will believe that I'm their only hope and that they will come like in the Old Testament where they would walk and put their hand on that innocent lamb and they would confess their sins over the lamb and then the lamb would be taken away from them and slaughtered. Jesus said, I am the once and for all lamb. You placed the hand of faith on me and believed that you sinned and are guilty and worthy to face everlasting destruction. And I will satisfy God's wrath and take forever what you deserve. Well, this morning, how can you apply the wrath of Revelation 6? I mean, it's avoided by most people. That's a negative thing. Who wants to talk about that? Well, the best way I know is to renew our thanksgiving for what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And that's because in the doctrine of justification, do you know what the doctrine of justification says? That in Christ, the wrath of God was satisfied. That's what justification means. So you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about a poem. Here's a 12-year-old poem. And what I thought is, you've been sitting so long, let's all stand. We'll quote poetry, okay? Let's, let's read this poem together. And as we read it, I'm going to show you the second stanza, and I want to point out something very amazing in the second stanza, okay? So just read with me this poem. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Now look at the bolded line in the second stanza. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. And then look at the faith. Here, in the death of Christ, I live. When it's my sin, on him, I live. So you know what I thought would be great? The best way to apply Revelation 6 is to cause us to burst out into personal offerings of thanks to God. And I'm looking, it's only 1140. Can you believe that? Seems like we've been here for hours. We actually have enough time to sing this to the Lord. Okay? So if you know it, make it, this is, now we're not having a singspiration. Now this is a personal offering. And as we go through these words, make them your thanksgiving to the Lord. Or if you've never received Christ, make them your asking for this gift. Here we go. You're singing so fast, we have time for the last one. Here we go. And this is the best. And you want to know why you should talk to your coworker or your neighbor or your fellow student or the person you carpool with or the one that's been on the other side of your fence or the other side of your street for so long you've never met him? If you really believe that the wrath of God is forever going to burn against every sin your neighbor has ever committed, you would go, or your relative, or your child, or whoever, you would go to them and say, you know, the greatest news I ever heard is, I am guilty, I'm worth hell, fire, and damnation forever, but on the cross, do you really understand the cross? Jesus died bearing my sins, and all the target of God's wrath on the cross have you ever put your faith and placed your hands of faith on Christ and asked him to be your sin bearer? And they go, no, I don't go to church. You say, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is salvation. So let's sing about that, and then it'd be nice to share it with someone, okay? Here we go. Father in heaven, I thank you that you commended your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died and bore your wrath so that if we by faith reach out, we can have 
our sins forever gone. I pray that we'd be so thankful about that that we'd share it, that we'd live it, that we would realize that's the gospel and that's all that matters forever. And I pray you'd teach us that truth this day. In the precious name of Jesus and for your glory we pray and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. Amen.